Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma, Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. And the truth that is rooted within me. I am welcome to our show today. The call-in number is 646-200-4169. And we have the chat room open, and there's a few people already out there listening on the on the phone. If you have a question, hit 1. It'll raise your hand. We'll put you in queue. Michael, good morning. Good morning, dear heart. And uh, we're delighted to be here with you. This is actually day 9 of our Memorial Day celebration. For those who haven't been with us, nine days ago, we decided the best way that we could memorialize and honor those who have been forced to kill, who have been killed, who have been maimed, injured, otherwise harmed physically or psychologically in war and their families, is to heal war in ourselves. And so we're going to carry on this Memorial Day celebration every day for the rest of eternity and invite our listening audience to select one issue. One upset, small or large, that's going on in your life uh, where there's perhaps pain in your body somewhere, pain in your emotional body, pain in your mental body, and maybe you're blaming someone else. Maybe you think it's somebody else's fault. And if they just changed, then things would be better. And we're going to invite you to take a little different tact and to face that from the point of view of responsibility. If you're feeling it, it's in your structure. If it's in your structure, then it has to belong to you. Uh, most people would say, but they're the one with the problem. It's like, excuse me, if they're the one with the problem, why aren't they the one with the pain? Why am I the one with the pain? I'm the one with the pain because though they may also have a problem, I have one. And my business is my problem, not theirs. So we're, we're inviting you to pick an issue that you're willing to use. If you're not familiar with our tools, please go to the website, www.whyagain.com www.whyagain.com. On the right-hand side of the page, there's a link. And the link says Download Worksheets. Please go to the first two uh, links under that section, and you will find uh, a new Chapter 24 of my book, Why Is This Happening to Me Again?, which explains the forgiveness process in the Aramaic from the internal perspective, not the game that the world is playing that we're going to forgive everybody else for what's going on inside of us, and then the sec- second link is the how-to worksheet. It's the step-by-step process. So the first link explains it. The second link is how is the worksheet itself. And so we invite you to download that and to begin the process or take another step in the process that each day of each of us will look at one issue that we're holding. And we can truly honor those people who have gone before us in this insanity on our planet called war and uh Let loose of it. There's an interesting uh, quote that uh, someone had sent to me that uh, was uh, posted on a sign next to a covered wagon in Phoenix, Arizona, I guess an old-timey wagon sitting at one of the entrances to Phoenix. And the sign says this, The cowards did not start. The weak fell by the wayside. Only the strong survived. And that kind of speaks about Uh, We humans, the same quote could be applied to our willingness to be responsible for our lives, our willingness to heal ourselves. We've been hearing from people, you know, almost on a daily basis who've faced monumental challenges in their lives, and once they got a hold of these tools and started to use them, were able to change the direction of that challenge. Didn't mean there weren't challenges left, but it takes courage. So uh, for those who... uh, 
you know, this little sign from Phoenix, Arizona makes sense, you won't start if you're afraid to look inside yourself. And I understand that, and we're just here to support you, realizing that you can do this work. Uh, and, you know, if, if you've tried and you've tried and you say, oh, but I've tried everything. If you haven't tried the Aramaic teaching on forgiveness, you haven't tried everything. If you're talking about, I forgive you for what you did to me, you haven't done the work of going inside yourself and looking at what you've done to yourself and removing that. You know, I, I use an analogy. Let's imagine that um, that we have someone who calls. I have a company, let's say, that uh, they digs up and gets rid of people's parking lots. And I get a call from somebody who says, I, I don't believe that you get rid of parking lots. I don't believe you can be in that business because we know it's not possible. I say, what do you mean you know it's not possible? It's like, well, I've, I've had this parking lot outside my business for 20 years, and I have five employees, and every day, Eight hours a day, my employees go out, and we've worked in that parking lot for 20 years, and we've hardly, it's still there. So this can't be done. And they say, well, what have you been doing? Well, every morning, we have five employees, and we each go out, you know, rain, sleet, snow, doesn't matter, every day for 20 years. We've been going out with toothpicks, and we're working at that parking lot, and we know you can't get rid of a toothpick or of of a parking lot. And I say, yeah, you're right. With those tools, you can have a tough time doing it. And with the Greek forgiveness, you're going to have a tough time changing your life. And if you find a specific how-to, go inside yourself and remove your pain, then you can remove everything to do with pain from your life. So if I take this fellow who's got his parking lot that he's been working on for 20 years and I send over a bulldozer, his parking lot is history this afternoon. Aramaic forgiveness is a bulldozer for pain. It removes pain, trauma, hatred, envy, anger, rage, jealousy, greed, condemnation, guilt, fault, blame, gossip, slander. It removes it all. So we're going to invite you to memorialize those who fought and died or killed and really truly face something in you that is based in hostility or fear. And remove it. Forgive it. Kick it out of your field. It doesn't belong there. It doesn't belong in the human energy system. So that's our uh, support for you today, and we're here to assist you in that process. Uh, those who will start this process, and as that sign said from Phoenix, the weak fell by the wayside. There are those who, when they start to face themselves internally, become so stressed they quit. They say, I can't do this, I don't have time, I, 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 and they've got all kinds of excuses. Strong, or those who choose to become strong, will keep walking through everything that comes up and move to the other side. I've, I've had the blessing, I, I've been fortunate. I started doing this work a little better than 40 years ago, and I did it part-time for about six years. And I, over that time period, I really started to recognize the value of it. And there came a point where I realized that the best way to become a full-time student of this work was to become a full-time teacher of it. It's kind of like forced evolution. You know, when you're standing in front of a group and every issue you've never dealt with is sitting out there in a seat, that stuff starts to move and you have to process yourself. And we define in this work process as the ability to hold the space of love inside yourself, active love, when something less than love comes up. That's how we're going to change the dynamic of war on this planet. When a critical mass, when enough people will say, I'm going to take responsibility and I'm going to move out of this insane mind. And, and we we use a definition, actually it's a definition I've been using for decades, but recently uh, had uh, Dr. Tim send me a, a quote from a book called The Gentle Art of Blessing, awesome book. And it's a quote from Gerald Jampolsky. And he's using the same definition of, of insanity as we've been using for decades. And Jampolsky is a psychiatrist. And here's what he said. If I could rewrite the American Psychiatric Association, Association's manual of diagnosis, it would be one page. And it would read, insanity is when we're not experiencing ourselves as love and giving that love away. Our definition of this work of insanity is the same. Are you insane? 
you have somebody in your life, you know, are you normally a fairly sane person? And you have that one person in your life that you just have to hear their voice on the telephone or see their face or, or hear that they're coming and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose in you? Well, if so, then that hell is forgivable. It is an internal internal condition that is totally and completely removable. And that's what we're here to support you in. And what we're going to invite you to consider is that rather than functioning as part of the herd, the majority, The idea is to escape from the ranks of the insane because the majority in our culture are insane. And and that's not a put down, that's just saying they're functioning without the active presence of love in their lives. Any one of us, and of course I include myself, and I go insane from time to time. When I'm not functioning out of love, I, I'm functioning out of an insane mind. I'm functioning out of a mind that's totally and completely in error and off base. So here, we're here to support you looking at the issues that can take you off base. And, of course, those things are inside of you. Nothing outside of you can take you off base. If there's something inside of you that can take you off base, somebody's going to show up and show it to you. But trying to change it outside when you, the place where it's healed is inside is just another form of insanity. And having the stories and the conversations about how they did and what they did and if only they would change and if only leaves you with an isolated part of self that holds pain that needs to be forgiven. That's all. It just needs to be forgiven. And, you know, when you look at, you know, have you ever, have you ever said to yourself, you know, I really lost it. Well, what did you lose it to? You didn't lose it to them. You know what you lost it to? Your own internalized hostility and or fear. And so it's time for us to let go of that fear-based mind, that hostility-based mind, come back to a sane mind, which means you might be doing a lot of generational work. You might have to look at a lot of dynamics that you didn't even initiate, at least this time around, and recognize that and begin to change that, and everything starts to shift. So that's what we're here for this morning. Jeannie, do we have any callers? Is Dr. Tim with us? Is David with us? Yes, David and Tim are both on, but we also have a question from Germany. Oh, cool. Awesome. And it says, I have a question about responsibility and blame. When I think of all the terrible things that I or my loved ones have experienced, death, disease, arson, cancer, abandonment, mobbing, Am I responsible for all of that? I feel dreadful. I must be a monster. I can hardly make it out of bed in the morning, let alone breathe the whole day. I must have misunderstood something because it provokes enormous pain, enormous pain when you say that if there is pain, then I must be insane. Um, Is there a way to explain this again that I can understand? How am I responsible and yet not to blame? Uh, awesomely said. Uh, I understand your dilemma totally. Been there, done that, and uh, uh, empathize with your pain. And the first thing I'll offer is that we hold the space of love, uh, that we're here to be the support space for the opening of that pain and the removal of it. And by the way, you can go to our website and you can download the book free in German uh, and the worksheet, and start to work with the worksheet process in German, if that's your native language, although your English sounds awesome, so perhaps it's uh, your, your English is your primary language. But, you know, that's why I read that uh, that quote from the covered wagon in Phoenix, uh, you know, as the, the settlers went west, uh, what they said was, you know, the cowards didn't start. They didn't, they didn't even go. It was just too much for them. And, and uh, the difficulty of starting to realize that I'm responsible. Now, let, let, let's see. Let, let's start from scratch here. Have you ever held a newborn child? If you have, then I'm going to ask you to hold that newborn again. Just imagine that you're holding the newborn and tap into the essence of that newborn. We've asked the question of tens and tens of thousands of people all over the globe in every culture and everybody describes their newborn with a word that's some variation on the theme of love. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is just to close your eyes for a moment and take a deep breath. And as you're feeling that pain and those judgments about yourself, 
I'm going to invite you to breathe deeply and allow the essential nature of the newborn energy. If you've never held a newborn, I'll invite you to take my newborn story. I birthed both of my children at home. Uh, It's scary to think that they're now in their 30s. (laughs) Time flies. But my daughter, when her head delivered, and it was only her head that had delivered, her eyes opened, wide, clear, totally focused eyes. Now, they say that a, a, a newborn can't focus for whatever time period. Totally wide open focused eyes, looked me right in the eye and grinned with one of the biggest grins you've ever seen a baby's face give you. So I invite you to tap into that energy. It literally sent me into another dimension. It was one of the turning points in my life because I had been structured and and brought up and raised in a world of hostility, fear, blame, war, all the insanities that go on. And Tapping into my daughter's essence, it was actually a Friday afternoon, May 22nd, 1981. I had a class that weekend, and there was a fellow, I was in, I had a, a home with a classroom in it in Atlanta, and there was a fellow from Florida who was, had already left Florida. It was 3 in the afternoon. The class was to start at 7. I couldn't reach him. There were no cell phones back then. So he was on his way, and I had to do the class. I couldn't have him drive all the way from South Florida and telling me he had to turn around and go back. So I greeted people at 7 o'clock in the evening with this newborn in my arms, and nobody believed that she'd been born four hours earlier. I went down into my classroom to start to teach, and I could not think a thought. The impact of that total active presence of love was so powerful for me that my mind stopped functioning. I learned later that that's actually a Buddhist principle, and one of the goals in Buddhism is to get to the state of no mind. It was like there was such an absolute, total, complete presence of love. And the topic I was teaching on is about the work we're talking about here. And it just was like it came from a place direct in me. It didn't go through my mind. It didn't have to do with my mind. I couldn't think a thought. So I invite you to tap into that level of the presence of love and then recognize that you have in you from what you've described, and of course I'm talking about all of us, myself included, you have the memory of the pain of every insane behavior that's been done in your bloodline in at least the last four generations. And if you look around at what's happened in Germany, what's happened in America, at what's been done to people, it is just totally outrageously inhuman. People will say, how could human beings do that? I would offer human beings can't do that. It is non-humans who do that. It is those without the active presence of love in them that are simply running their lives out of a database that responds the way dad, mom, grandpa, great-grandpa, great-great-grandpa, great-great-grandma responded. Whatever they made up in their not knowing, if it was rage, if it was fear, if it was murder, they did it. And we have that in us. Now, your being, I would offer, is the essence of this newborn. It is love. That's what you and I are. That's what 7 billion people on this planet are. And when we come into the world, our culture, our family culture, our educational culture, our religious culture, our political culture, starts to put into us, starts to put thumbprints on us based in insanity. Uh, All you have to do is sit for five minutes in front of the TV and flip channels every 30 seconds and listen to how many words are based in love and how many words are based in rage and fear and insanity and and gossip and all the crazy stuff. And and, and you can see how much our culture has been destroyed by that mindset. Now, when we start to put have these thumbprints put on us. And you might want to look at the, uh, or get a copy of the codependence video that we do because we explain exactly how this non-being self is formed. 
and it's formed by the messages that we get from the people in our lives that have more power over us than we do. So this, there's a self that's developed. And, and if you look at the messages, you know, usually when I work with the average group, and I say, well, what were some of the messages you got from your family system? Mine were, you're stupid, you're incompetent, you never could, you never will, you're not good enough. And people uh, usually respond with things like, um, yeah, you'll never make it, uh, you're bad, you're evil, you're wicked, all, all the projections of the culture. And then add to that, we'll throw in a little eternal damnation threat to just keep you in terror and fear. And what happens is over time, and this happens within the first four to five years of life, we build a self into our minds based on these crazy messages. So now we have a self that is true, the true self, love, and we have a non-being self. And what happens is there comes a point, in my experience, it is the most painful moment in one's developmental phases when they give up the direct experience of their being as love and fall into identification with the self that isn't true, a self that's based in pain. Now, recognizing those two selves, if we're functioning out of the non-being self, out of the hostility and fear-based self, if we've never been introduced into the idea that we are love, if we've never had the cellular experience of the presence of love in our bodies because there's so much drama and trauma in there, then it's difficult to imagine ourselves as love. Take my word for it. That's who you are. I've worked with people on every level uh, in prison, uh, drug, alcohol, and each one, when they find their essential self, it's made of love. So <clears throat> blame is a word that describes what the non-being self has been trained through. That's the basic principle of the non-being self is blame. When the, the adult that was caretaking us didn't know how to be responsible for, our, for themselves, for their own pain, they put blame on the child. Look what you did. You broke it. You spilled the milk. You didn't. And, and all these messages of blame. So this non-being mind thinks in terms of and cycles through blame, 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 blame. So when the average person hears the word responsibility, what they hear is, you mean I'm to blame? I'm the guilty party? I'm at fault? I'm the one who's bad? I'm the one who's wrong? Notice, if you would, that there is nothing in the word responsibility about guilt, fault, blame, bad, or wrong. Evil, nasty, there's nothing there about that. It doesn't mean that. That's the non-being mind's reality about responsibility. I would offer that when you work with responsibility as we're teaching it here in this work, responsibility is a tool with which to access the parts of you that aren't true about you because what tends to happen, just like the, the power person, the person who gave this child all the messages about how terrible they were and how bad they were and how evil they were and how wicked they were and how incompetent they were and how stupid they were, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, who gave all of those messages to the child had a dynamic and the dynamic was copied by the non-being mind, blame. And in order to play the, the, the game out over and over and over, that you're to blame for what's happening inside of me, I have to hide that whole dynamic from myself. So when I'm in pain and I don't know how to work through it, I have to deny my pain. I have to say, you know, this isn't me. It's Charlie who did it. It's my mother who did it. It's my father who did it. It's it's everybody else. It's my employer. It's my neighbor. It's, it's the person of this other race, of this other color, whatever it is. There's always somebody else to blame. And that comes from the state of denial. When I deny ownership for what's going on inside of me, what I do is I create a totally unnatural condition in my mind. And the condition I create is a dissociated state. So when I deny... I'm saying to my mind, mind, you are not allowed to show me this 
again. So from the age of two, three, four, as we deny and we hide our pain, five, six, seven, go through those years where there are bullies and there are, you know, every, we get exposed through mass education, the lowest common denominator in the culture and the rages and the fears and, and the, the, you know, the, the, the small-mindedness of the non-being child that abuses then move on up into the teen years and all the confusion and all the messages in the culture that's insane about sex. You know, sex is dirty. Save it for the one you love. There's something wrong with you that you're a sexual being. And then we go into a relationship with all this hostility, fear, rage, guilt, grief, pain, and, and we wonder why the relationship isn't wonderful. Of course, it must be our partner's fault. And so we go through that and we divorce and we kick them out of our lives and we go looking for somebody else, looking for love in all the wrong places. So now we have a huge quantity of data that is built upon generational insanity that everything that's wrong in my life is somebody else's fault. Well, now I have in my dissociated mind this huge bag of pain and trauma that I've been accumulating for decades. And I have no idea it's mine because I've dissociated from it. Now I'd offer out of the dissociated mind, energetically, we are energetic beings, I set up signals that invite people to come to me and to show me those things I've hidden from myself because I desperately need to heal them. But when I remain in denial, I keep that part of me hidden. My mind hallucinates a whole world that doesn't exist and it's the world where everybody else is to blame. And again, I throw in the question, if they're the one with the problem, why am I the one with the pain? I'm the one who carries something inside of me that doesn't belong inside of me. So my mind projects, and it all looks like it's somebody else's fault. And out of that, I do crazy things. I do abusive things. I use abusive words. I maybe use abusive hands or weapons or, or what have you. Am I to blame for that? No, I'm just playing out what's in there. But when all of a sudden I recognize, you know, there's an ancient principle in the, in the ancient scriptures that says, for a lack of knowledge, my people have been destroyed. If we don't know how we work, then we can't correct what's out of place. Once you understand this flow that we've, we've offered and build the brain cells to really comprehend it, then you begin to open what in the ancient teachings was called the veil of the temple. You know, when they spoke in the ancient teachings about the veil of the temple must be rent in twain, and it's a scriptural quote, they weren't talking about a purple curtain in a church. They were saying that there is a barrier. It's called the veil, or the barrier between the subconscious and the unconscious mind that keeps everything you never want to deal with hidden from you. It takes courage to say, I'm going to start to open that. And it sounds like you're starting to open that. And your first peek in there is terrifying because there is terror and rage and everything that's, that's gone on in your life and in your family system. You know, what was, uh, what was happening with your parents a generation ago uh, as they went through their lives, their young lives and going through it? If they lived in Germany, as, as you do right now, oh, the horrendous stuff they were put through as little kids. I mean, how insane is it for a, a child of, that is being, that is love, to be told, you know, Daddy just had his body blown to bits by a bomb. He went outside and he shouldn't have. He shouldn't have stayed in the bomb. You know, I mean, on and on and on it goes. So when one gathers the courage to say, I'm going to take responsibility. What happens is they start to open this veil, this barrier, and get to look at what's in there. Most people shut it off and run the other way. I don't want to touch that. I don't want to deal with that. But what was presented 2,000 years ago in the ancient Aramaic language, as opposed to a religious system, was a system for being able to open that barrier, to go inside yourself, and start to change those dynamics. You don't have to take it on all at once. We have a whole series of tools of how to, and that's what our radio show is about, is to create support for people 
to work through these issues. And I hear you loud and clear. I identify with the pain that you feel when you start to look there because you may be the first person in who knows, maybe a thousand generations, that's ever even started to open that barrier and go, what's in there? And when you open that barrier and start to look what's in there, there's some pretty heavy-duty stuff. And know that we're here to hold the space of love. And, and by the way, all you have to do is open that veil and learn to keep love present. And what will happen is all of the terror, all of the trauma, all of the drama that you're willing to access starts to dissolve. You access it by taking responsibility. Being responsible for what's going on inside of you does not mean you're to blame for anything that's happened outside of you. Being responsible for what goes on inside of you means that you get to see it directly and you get to start to change it. Again, perhaps the first one in a thousand generations. That's even conceived that that's possible. And we're here to support you in doing it. And Jean tells me that we... Are there any other comments from the person from Germany at this point in the chat room? No? Okay. Well, we've got a call on it. Jeannie. Area code 804. You're on the air. Yes, this is absolutely fascinating because I'm standing in my truth and I've been through some pretty horrific things. And one... Who are we uh, talking to? Where are you calling from? Uh, my name is uh, Hugh. I'm calling from Virginia. Delighted to have you with us, Hugh. Thanks for your call. How can we support you? Well, I'm standing in my truth, and everything you're saying is just phenomenal uh, and very accurate. And I wanted to see if you might take an interest in learning just who I am and some of the things I've been through, because that's part of what I feel my life's message is, that uh, I'm trying to show other people to face their fears and to put love into their hearts and ask the Creator for uh, guidance for whatever their mission is in this life. Well, that's what we're here to support as well. And is there some specific support we can be for you right now? Uh, yes. Uh, if I can share a blog with you, it will give some preliminary information about me. Uh, if you Google the word creativity, the number 777.com, uh, that uh, has a letter from the president as well as a powerful little poem I created many years ago as a motivator for my own life. It's in the President Ronald Reagan Library, discussed as a weapon against terrorism, and currently I'm using it to help the people of Haiti who can't help themselves. It's three lines long. It's titled caring sharing and it reads if you dare to care then share if you share pay heed god will reward every good deed it sort of sums up what life should be all about um my current right, you got my support and agreement on that one 100 percent. yes my current situation is i went through a, a horrific experience and put myself in the hands of god and came through it all right but i still have uh uh, lingering mental anguish about certain aspects of it uh, and I forgave everybody immediately but there are people that cause so, I'm so sorry? Let, me, let me get to ask you let me ask you to hold there for a second here sure what we're going to suggest is to please stop forgiving people and please stop forgiving yourself because what's happened is we've been sold a bill of goods we've been sold a fraud and the fraud is that if I have pain inside of me, what I need to do is forgive you. You know, the, the, the Greek translation that takes these Aramaic ideas of a man named Yeshua turns them around backward. And so we're taught, I have all this pain inside of me, and you, you did something really terrible that caused it, but it's okay, I'll forgive you. Which does nothing to change the pain that's inside of me. It just leaves you in exactly the same state that you described as that of anguish because you've done nothing to address and remove the anguish at this point. So my offering is that forgiveness and what we're working to reestablish on planet Earth is the actual original Aramaic idea of forgiveness. So if Hugh interacts with somebody and they do something crazy and Hugh has all kinds of pain about it or 
anguish is, I think, believe was the word that you used, then I would advise you to, if you choose to, pardon them. Okay, I'm going to let you off the hook for what you did. What you did was crazy, you know, to that other person. And then I'm going to hand you a tool, and that's on our website at www.whyagain.com. On the right-hand side, click Download Worksheets. The first two links are an explanation of the Aramaic forgiveness process and the worksheet itself. So what I'm going to invite you to do is to take that worksheet and start to put the pen to the paper, paper, and it will show you how to go inside your own dissociated mind and remove the anguish so that you can look at all those situations that yesterday you think caused you anguish. You can take responsibility for them. doesn't mean you're to blame for what somebody else did, but as you take responsibility for those things, you start to see the root of them inside of you, and you have the opportunity to remove those things. And so that's what we're here to uh, to support. So we're we're working to establish a totally, completely uh, different idea of forgiveness, and that is, it's a tool with which I go inside myself and change what's happening inside of me. And I and I'm on your website, and I see the acknowledgement of Anne, and uh, I love the poem, if you dare to care, then share. If you share, pay heed. God will reward every good deed. You got my support in that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've found in my life that, uh, you know, and a lot of people have all kinds of crazy ideas based on fear-based theology about God. The simple bottom line is God is love. And so I like to uh, to offer that uh, that definition that, uh, that the creator is the active presence of love that we can tap into, live in, and that will heal us. And uh, I'm certainly here to support that anguish that you're talking about letting go. Yes, if that I could just nice share my dilemma, uh, I had actually people that caused me to be arrested. It was thrown out of court, and uh, they broke the law. And I have no finances to take them. The only thing I could do eventually is a civil action. So that's part of my dilemma. Right. Okay. So so my first order of business would be, if you're in anguish about it, again, I think that's the word you used, if yeah. you're in anguish about it, a mind in anguish is insane. You won't be able to see what your real options are and what the real possibilities are. So I'd invite you to... To solve the dilemma that you're in, I'd invite you to the first step would be, and, and that doesn't mean don't hold these people accountable legally for what they've done. That's but my the point. First yeah. order of this, yeah, right. The first order of business is I can't approach them and take the speck out of their eye while I have this being called anguish in my own because I'm not very smart when I'm in anguish. You know, I, I asked the question earlier about who's held a newborn, and everybody on the planet's answer is always some variation on the theme of love. But we have a corresponding question that we ask in our Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop, and that is we ask the question, how many have ever done something they regret? And, of course, you know, a number of people in the room will put their hand up. And, and so we then ask people to uh, to tap into. Think about one time when you did something that you regretted and what were you feeling. And everybody's answer, I don't care what culture we ask it in, whenever somebody does a regret, their answer is always some variation on the theme of hostility or fear. It's rage, it's sadness, it's grief, it's jealousy, it's hatred, it's vengeance, it's weak. It, you know, their feelings are always indicators of which mind is operating in them. So a mind that's filled with anguish doesn't have the full sanity possible for an actual human life. So the first order of business I would offer would be rather than going off trying to hold them accountable for their illegal behaviors, which, if it's appropriate, when you get to a mind connected to love, if it's appropriate to do that, I'd be the first one to support you, hold them accountable. It might mean picking up the phone and calling the police and saying there's illegal activity here, you need to come and investigate. That's right on track, but first and foremost, you want to make sure you've handled the log in your own eye. And right now I would offer that log would be your anguish. So rather than forgiving them for your anguish, I invite you to take that worksheet, start to put the pen to the paper, the instructions are there for it, 
If while you're doing it you come up with any questions, you know, over the next days, we'll be delighted to have you call back in and, and answer specific questions about that worksheet. But the first thing you want to do, Hugh, is you want to collapse that anguish so that you're connected to a mind of love, so that you're connected to your human life. And that would be the first order of business I would offer. Yes, I, I feel that I've done that, but uh, I, if I can send you some brief information about it, maybe you'll get a better understanding. Cause, uh, sure. If you just the, go to our website. If, if yeah, I, I found website, your address in Missouri, so I'll, I'll send link, this snail mail yeah. to you, but uh, it, it is so you can fascinating, email it, but, uh, and I appreciate but when you it. Say you feel, yeah. Hugh, when you say you feel like you've done that already, that's not what your words said. Your words All right. said uh, well, you, were in ang- you were in anguish. Okay, I, I use that word because there's some things that are unresolved, and I have an issue that there was some police corruption involved with this, too, and I can't get any right. satisfaction from anyone. They just want it to go away, and that's why I, I said that one. anguish. Yep. So, so now I'm going to invite you to take the worksheet, uh-huh. apply it to your anguish, until you can come to this situation without anguish, you will not see all the options open to you. Because right. it's it's like a, a horse putting a pair of blinders on a horse. You do that so they'll go down a narrow path. Our culture that wants to control us has put a set of blinders on us. <clears throat> the left eye blinders hostility, the right eye blinders fear. And now, just like the horse, we can only see what's directly in front of us. There's a whole, you know, we can see maybe, oh, what would that be, 40 degrees of vision. And the other 320 degrees is totally invisible. By actually removing that blinder of anguish, you'll have 360-degree vision. You will see far more options. You will be far more empowered. And you will come to this from a totally different space. And this is what we mean by our celebration of Memorial Day, and this being day nine of it, we're going to ask you to make this contribution to getting rid of war on the planet. If you open the space in you to forgive your capacity for anguish, I would offer you will be able to come back to exactly the same situation with the corruption that nobody wants to hear about it, and you will see a totally different light and a totally different world. You know, if you weren't on the show yesterday, you might want to download the archive of the show yesterday. We had a young woman who started to do this work back in January. And uh, she comes from a family tradition. uh, She's from Argentina and comes from a family tradition where uh, men marry women, have babies, leave them, and run off with other women. Uh, Her mother had it happen, and it's in her generational bloodline. And when we first met her, she was dealing with some of these issues. She started to do the forgiveness process. Yesterday, she called in and shared just some awesome and powerful openings. I think you might find that inspirational, although the issue is a little different. The principle is the same. When we come from a space of being, when we reclaim our human life, the culture doesn't want you to reclaim your human life. That's why we've been taught or we've had these blinders called hostility and fear put on. So we have this narrow vision that we only see what the culture's brainwashed us to. It's all everybody else's fault, and there's no hope. In your being, there is power, there is healing, there is hope. Please that is my message. Uh, that's I'm, I'm yeah. standing in my truth on everything you're saying, and I, I have a bliss. I, I'm doing wonderful things. And uh, well, can I share... Two people for your interest. The one is a presidential candidate. He's a wonderful humanitarian. He knows this whole situation. His site is Light Party, L-I-G-H-T-P-A-R-T-Y dot com. And a friend of his has the Worldwide Forgiveness Alliance, a Dr. Robert Plath. I don't know if you're I know Bob. With- I know Bob. In fact, I've been talking to Bob regularly over the last three months. And All right. I he know knows the whole situation. Project to, yeah. I know the project that's uh, that's being worked on to uh, convert uh, Alcatraz. Uh, I'm familiar with the folks at the Light Party, and uh, I'm okay, they both track. know the whole situation I'm discussing yeah. okay. with you, and I'm yeah. trying to assist but them my, my with point. their work. And I have a total yeah. blitz in what I'm doing. Yeah, 
great, but you've got some anguish that I'm going to invite you to be responsible for and forgive and see what happens. Yes, I, and I spoke with someone who wrote a book on forgiveness, and she said to me she was surprised that I was okay. able to forgive immediately. I said, that's okay. my faith, but she said forgiveness and justice are two different things. So that's, uh, again, yeah. justice has not been served. Yeah, well, my, my I'm so glad you know those gentlemen, though, so I'll, I'll send you yes, I know, I know information, and then you can follow up as you see. Yeah, I, love the, I love the music that the folks at the Light Party are doing and the videos, the creative stuff they're doing is awesome. And Bob Platt, we actually tried to get together with Bob, Bob to, on this trip to uh, to do some work around Forgiveness Day and, and keynote and address for him. But in the meantime, I noticed that every time I ask you the question, you take your conversation somewhere else, and I'd offer that perhaps you might want to look at there's some avoidance here and and you want to claim bliss and and pretend that the conversation about anguish never happened my invitation to you once again i'm going to keep drawing you back yeah you know i is. know you're wanting me to go on the worksheets as part of my evasion because i just have a web browser on my cell phone i don't have any computer or anything so i'm limited as far as what i'm able to access well, you can go to the library. You can print those chapters off at the library very inexpensively if you need a, a direct computer, and uh, and you can uh, download them and start to do that worksheet. Also, if you've got a browser on your website, you can go to whyagain.com, and uh, there's actually a worksheet you can do on online with your uh, with your phone. But I'm going to invite you to consider. There's a part of you that you don't want to deal with. There's a part of you there's denial about, but you know, Shakespeare gave us a wonderful piece of information. He said, my words fly up, my thoughts remain below. And when we're doing just normal conversation, what will happen is our words will show us where our work is and what we're in denial about. Once that comes out and it's pointed out, then the mind will try to go to a thousand different places in order not to deal with that. And my work is about getting, getting rid of war on the planet. And we get rid of war by removing the hostility, fear, conflict, and pain inside of ourselves. We don't get rid of war by changing other people or holding other people accountable. In fact, if out of my anguish I try to hold somebody else accountable, I'm a contributor to war. And I can have all the moments of bliss I want, but if there's a part of my mind that I'm still holding that holds anguish, even though my mind says it's totally justified, look what they did to me, Q is your anguish, and you can help to get rid of war on planet Earth by forgiving your capacity for anguish. And as you do, you'll open the energy window for all of humanity to start to let loose of this anguish and for us in mass to be finished with it. That's fascinating. So, Thank you so much for that. you. And, yeah, and, and please, uh, you know, sometimes the... The complexities in the mind as you do the forgiveness process from the website uh, can seem to make it very complicated. The truth is it's a very simple process. And so uh, if, if you have questions, I would, I would really appreciate it if you look at that web worksheet, work start to work with it, and then any questions or refinements that come up, it would be an awesome contribution to call back into the show and ask those questions. And, you know, there's a, there's a whole co conversation going on in the culture of what we need to end war and conflict is justice. And I offer it is not justice. Justice for the non-being minded in most people's conversation really means I want to get even. That's what most people's reality behind justice is. My offering is that a... A just world will come about when each of us takes responsibility. Whether we're the victim or the person who's victimizing, if we each take responsibility for what's going on inside of us, we'll dissolve the line between victim and victimizer, and together we'll heal. So I thank you for your call. It's awesome, and I love your poem, and I'll, I'll take more time and look at your website. Well, what? thank you, and God bless you for all that you're doing to heal the world. All right, sir. Take care. Bye-bye. By the way, uh, before we do that, Jeannie, just let me uh, offer that uh, we're in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're getting ready to get on an airplane Thursday morning and fly up to 
uh, Ashland and uh, Ashland and Mike, I keep losing her. Medford, Medford, Oregon. <laughs> so starting on Thursday, actually, Jeannie just put a new flyer on the website. Thursday, we're going to be doing a presentation Thursday evening in Ashland, Friday morning, Friday evening, uh, and then Saturday again. There are about five different events over the first couple of days that we're there. And then on Sunday morning, we'll be speaking at Unity of Medford uh, at their Sunday service. And then uh, Sunday afternoon, we're going to do three workshop wise. It's happening to me again. Those other five workshops, by the way, that I spoke about in, in Ashland are all free. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, all free workshops at Unity of Medford. Saturday, we're going to do Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing. When we travel, that's the only paid workshop that we do. And so if you're in that area, tap into it. And then on Sunday, we're going to be at Unity in Ashland doing their Sunday service. And then because the Unity Center there doesn't have a church of their own or a space of their own, we're going to go back Sunday afternoon to Unity in Bedford, and we're going to do the Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop again. By the way, if you happen to come the first Sunday that we're there, which is this Sunday coming, you will be amazed at what I've learned in just a week if you come the next Sunday for the same workshop. Uh, it's always amazing uh, to people that they uh, could, have, uh, could have a whole new experience in just a week. And then Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, we'll be doing more workshops at Union Metro. So we got a, a long series of workshops there, and then we're going to hop on an airplane and go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where we're going to be – actually, we're going to fly into Lauderdale, but we're going to be in Hallandale, uh, Florida, in uh, a place called the Regency – uh, health resort, and we're going to be keynoting at a medical conference there. For those who might be in South Florida who might want to do that, you need to call the Regency Resort and just see what kind of arrangements. It's actually a residential weekend, uh, you know, Friday, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and it's a residential program. But I think they've got space for people to come in just for, you know, one workshop or the other. So Friday night is when I'll be doing why is this happening to me again. And then we're back to Heartland, uh, the 18th of uh, July, to begin our uh, Heartland intensive season there. The schedule for that's on our website. So, Jenny, you've got uh, a question or a chat or a, something in the chat room? Yes. Um, first, there was a question in the chat room. It says, uh, so are you talking about accepting responsibility for putting yourself in the situation in the first place, even though you're the one that was being abused? Okay, so for the person that's being abused, I want to find a part of me that says I deserve abuse. That, that's part of the dissociated mind. You know, we did a lot of work in the prisons years ago, and uh, what we found in the prisons was when we talked to people who were the criminals was that most of them felt better when they were punished. They knew they'd done something that they called wrong, and they felt better having been punished. So if I put myself in a situation where I'm abused or punished somehow, I want to look inside myself and be clean and clear that, okay, is there any part of me that participates in this? Because it's a participatory world. Nothing can come to me that is outside of. In fact, if you go back to the ancient Aramaic where they talked about the laws of how the universe works, there was a, a really simple summation of the law that actually comes down to three simple words that not even – a Philadelphia lawyer could misinterpret. And what it says is, ask and you receive. If you receive, I offer there's a part of you with which you've asked. You're not to blame for that. You're not bad for that. You're not wrong for that. You're not guilty of that. It's just in you. And it may be something that has nothing to do with you personally even. It may be something that's five generations old. You know, if you look in the, in, again, in the ancient scriptures, these, these things are about physics. They're about physiology. They're about genetics. They're not about theology. And they said the sins of the fathers will be passed the A into three and four generations. They said look to the lives of the fathers for ours are but a shadow of theirs. So if we have someone in our generations that felt, you know, I need, to, I need to be guilty and I need to be punished for what I do, then Literally on an energetic level, you know, I've talked a couple of times, and this is the principle we cover in the Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop. I've talked a couple of times about uh, the work I just had the awesome privilege of doing with a, a really uh, just uh, what a man this guy was. 
his name was Marcel Vogel. He was a 23-year senior scientist from IBM. And Marcel had the instrumentation in his laboratory with which to take a picture of the high-energy waves that leave the mind when we think a thought. That literally, if I hold a genetic memory of I did bad, I'm evil, I need to be punished, then there is literally an actual measurable energy field that radiates out to me, from me, pardon me, to all the world. And basically what it says, and I like to call it the psychic megaphone, it says, hey, world, I did something really bad and I deserve to be punished. Are there any volunteers who would come and victimize me so that I can make up for my wrongdoing? Now, if I hold that part of me in denial and dissociation, then what happens is I get to live the title of Michael Rice's book, Why Is This Happening to Me Again? I promise you, I don't care where you go on the planet, you're going to find somebody to abuse you. Now, that doesn't mean you're to blame for being abused. Sometimes people will turn this work around and they'll say, see, it's all your fault. Michael Rice says you're responsible for this. Excuse me, no. I may be responsible for the fact that you're in my face doing this because there's a part of me that calls you forward from life. So, <clears throat> pardon me, it may be appropriate for me to pardon you. Okay, I'm going to let you off the hook for your pardoning it. And now I'm going to go inside myself and I'm going to remove that three-generational memory that says I'm supposed to be punished. I do that by taking responsibility. Responsibility is a tool that gives my mind permission to show me something that's inside of me that otherwise I haven't been looking at for generations. Responsibility doesn't mean I'm to blame or I'm guilty, I'm at fault for what anybody else does. Those people are responsible for what they do. But I'm responsible for my pain around it and I'm responsible for the issues that are in me that I don't want to look at around it. And so by taking responsibility and and forgiving, you collapse the dissociated mind. You come back into direct relationship with the part of you that's in need of healing. And this amazingly awesome thing happens. You heal. And we're here to support you in using the tools that it takes. You know, forgiveness is a bulldozer. It will go in and in very short order. If you have a question about that, please, if you weren't on the show yesterday, Tap into the show yesterday where a young lady called Nene called. She's been doing six months of work, and she speaks about an awesome breakthrough that she had. You can break through everything in your life that is less, less than the active presence of love. And that means that you'll be setting yourself up for the best year yet of your eternal life. So we're here to support you in that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Wright and his wife, Jeannie, who present the internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.mindshifters.com. Why again dot com that's www dot w h y a g a i n dot com continuously